those of you that uh, haven't met me yet, um, my name is uh, Joanna, Joanna Maisel. Um, I have been a guide at Nooculumin for the last 12 years. Uh, I made Aliyah to Israel uh, 32 years ago from London. Um, and uh, I like to actually, I like to actually say that I made, I feel like I made Aliyah twice. I feel like I made Aliyah, and I only realized this last week when I gave my first lecture. I made Aliyah in 1991 straight from university. And then I felt that my second Aliyah came um, in 2011 when I came to work here at Nord Kidumim. Because one was to Israel, and then when I came to Nord Kidumim, it was really a connecting of my soul to the land of Israel, to, to Eretz Yisrael, to the landscape. And really, plant, I like to think of, I sort of feel like I've planted myself, and, and, and I'm now just attached uh, through, through my roots to this, to this country. Um, so today, uh, I'm going to talk about something which... Even just in the last two minutes, I just connected with someone on this Zoom that we had a conversation about Zata, about Hisop, um, what do we say, seven, eight years ago, um, to, to Hisop um, in all its, all its understanding of, okay? Uh, Hisop is, is, well, you're going to see, you know what, I'm not going to introduce it, I'm just going to say Hisop, I'm going to share my, share my uh, let me just share my screen. And you will understand the whole scope of it. One second. Now I have uh, escape. One second. All right, slideshow. So I'm sharing. All right. Okay, screen is loading. All right, now you can see my screen. So here is my title Hyssop the Humble Herb. I like to do things with lots of matching letters. I know there's a name for it, but I can't remember what it is. So I like to find things which all have the same letter. Um, so I'm gonna start with a quote. Um, he talked about, so this is from the book of Kings 1, uh, chapter five, verse 13. So imagine we're sitting in a classroom. You may be sitting in some kind of room, office. It's a closed room, four walls. Um, and, uh, or if you're say a student, and you're studying in a class, in a class, you're uh, somebody who's gone to synagogue, to shul, for a lecture, for a shiur, and you've got your book open, you've got your Tanakh open, and you come across, you're studying the Book of Kings, and you come across this quote, which goes, he talked about the trees from the cedar of Lebanon to the hyssop that grows out of the wall. So you're like, okay, it's all about King Solomon. Um, so this book is, you know, is about King Solomon. It's uh, reportedly written by Jeremiah. And you're like, okay, so he talked about the trees a lot. Cedar of Lebanon, that's one kind of plant. Hyssop, another kind of plant. Great, two kinds of plants. Now, normally, when somebody gives an example of a couple of plants or a couple of something, they're doing it to do a comparison. They're doing it to show a scope or a range um, or a polarization. If you think about it in normal life, you could say somebody dressed badly. No, sorry, say that again, rephrase that. Somebody, some days they dress really well, some days they dress really badly. In fact, on the bad days, they dress like a scarecrow and on the good days, they look like a supermodel. All right, two extremes, supermodel versus scarecrow. When we talk about temperature, you could say, once I went on holiday and it was boiling hot as the Sahara, and once I went on holiday and it was so cold, it was like being in Alaska. Again, two extremes. So if we have a quote here, we're being given the names of the plants for a reason. We're being given a quote for a reason. These are two extremes. But what is our problem nowadays is that when reading, when we're reading the texts, when we're reading the sages, when we're reading the Tanakh, when we're reading the Torah, when we're studying the Talmud, the Mishnah, the language that they're using is not our language of today. And when I talk about language, I'm not talking about Hebrew or Aramaic or English or Latin or whatever language you are studying in. I'm talking about the language of the time they lived in. Um, I'm talking about, about the life that they, that what they lived and breathed from the second they woke up till the second they went to bed and while they were sleeping. Because our lives now are so far removed from anything at the time of the Tanakh, it's almost impossible to understand the references. And that's what we do here at Na'at Kudumim. We bring the Tanakh to life. We take you out of your classroom, out of your synagogue, and we put you in 
to the living world of the Tanakh. And when I say living, it's um, it's it's breathing it, it's smelling it, it's tasting the tasting the fruit, it's smelling the plants, it's touching it, it's just soaking up the whole atmosphere of what's going on. So as far as I'm concerned, what we do at No uh, is is uh, encapsulated in this quote. So I'm hoping that I'll be able to bring a little bit of Noot Kidumim to you today um, so you can appreciate uh, what we do and be able to really get to grips with this quote. So let's let's start from the beginning. Um, let's move on to, I'm going to show you the way I've done this is, why is this already playing when I didn't press play? Um, hold on a second. Why? Wait a second. This isn't good. Let's stop that. Okay. Um, the um, what I did was I went out into Noel Kidum this morning because I wanted to bring you live what was going on today, a snapshot of today in the in the year, because we're not an artificial Disney world of uh, plants. We're happening live as the seasons go on. Everything is changing according to the weather, according to the time of year, according to the Jewish seasons, the Jewish festivals. So the first example, what I'm going to show you is a clip that I took today of the cedar tree. So I went out at 10 o'clock this morning. It was hot. We're having a crazy hot November. We haven't really had winter rains yet. You're going to see in the pictures that everything is very dry. So look around. You can see the shrub here. Nothing green has come up yet. And I'm going to show you a video of the cedar tree. Okay, the cedar tree in Hebrew is called the Erez. And I'm standing and walking towards it now. As you can see, my head probably, yeah, you can see where my head is. That's my head where that branches are coming out. It's probably about another third taller than me. So let's just look at that. I zoomed into a branch. It looks a little bit like a Christmas tree, to be honest. Um, I'm zooming out now and taking you around. You can see the brown. You can see the distance, the, the hills of Judea in the distance. And I'm, wait, I was going to pause it there. Um, I'm going to play it again and talk while I'm playing it and then pause it. Okay, so when I say cedar tree, um, most people probably start imagining what they know about a cedar tree. And generally, people think of a cedar of Lebanon. Now, the cedar of Lebanon uh, is known and believed to, to be a very, very tall tree. If people think of a tall tree, an imposing tree, I'm just going to halt it one second on there. Okay, let's pause that. Um, a very tall tree, a very imposing tree. And um, they, uh, most importantly, we know that the cedars of Lebanon were brought from Lebanon down the Mediterranean. Um, uh, actually, to the left here is the Mediterranean. They were brought on the ancient road from um, the sea up to Jerusalem. They crossed over through our reserve. They came from this side. They crossed along here. And they went on up to Jerusalem in that direction, and they were used to build the temple. Um, and the temple was even known as the House of the Forest of Lebanon, because it was built by these imposing cedar trees. So I'm just wanting to have a good look at this cedar tree, which is probably about one and a half times as tall as I am. And then I'm going to stop sharing so I can talk to you directly on the screen. Um, so the two cedar trees we just saw, they are examples of the cedar trees. They are examples of the cedar trees um, we have in the Okidumim. So when I point out cedar tree to people and they look at them, I'm like, they're like, oh, they're baby cedar trees. And I'm like, no, they're not baby cedar trees. They're old baby cedar trees. They were planted probably around the time that the reserve was founded in the last some point in the last 50 years. And they just never grew. They never grew very much for one simple reason. A cedar tree is a very, very um, uh, spoiled. I like to use the word spoiled, spoiled tree. It needs height, which with us, it doesn't have. We're 600 feet above sea level and there's nowhere near the height required and that it has in Lebanon. It needs a lot of water. Well, we get 25 days of rain on average over the year and that is certainly not enough water for the cedar tree. It needs good soil. And our soil really isn't great, especially as so much of it has been um, eroded over the years. Um, so it's a very needy tree. It needs a lot. And if it doesn't get what it, get what it wants, then it doesn't grow very, very tall. Um, 
So this needy tree is actually referenced a few times in the in the in the Tanakh, in the Bible, and in the sages. Um, and um, and it's it's very very obvious. It's one of the actually one of the, the plants which is referenced directly to what it is a metaphor of or a symbol of. Um, and it is referenced uh, in the book of Isaiah, Isaiah chapter two, as uh, the following: this quote, "For the Lord of hosts has a day of doom waiting." For each that is proud and arrogant, for each that is high, so that it is brought low. For all the cedars of Lebanon, lofty and high, then man's pride shall be brought low, and the loftiness of man shall be humbled, and the Lord shall be exalted on that day. Okay, so the cedar is 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 described as proud uh, and arrogant, and um, that is uh, that that is its symbol, and that is how it's seen. Uh, we have a reference another stage, you shall preen yourself like a cedar, you know, preening is when you're kind of like in front of a mirror and making yourself and look, feeling how important, how important you, um, how important you look, um, you look in that. Um, so we understand the, the reference here, the cedars, I don't know if I mentioned the cedar in Hebrew is Eres, okay? Um, and like in the quote from Tehillim, Ke Eres Halvanon Yisken, um, like a cedar of Lebanon. Uh, will age. Um, so now having talked about the cedar, we've understood the, the botanical qualities of the cedar and, and what it symbolizes based on its botanical qualities. Um, we're going to move on to the, um, the hyssop, the azov. Uh, I'm going to share my screen and show you uh, show you my little uh, slide about the hyssop. Okay. Start sharing. Okay, just... Um, Ilan, oi met a Ilan, at Shama? Okay, oi met a masach shili? Okay. Okay. So I'm going to play a little video of his. Again, this video was taken this morning. Um, please note the brownness around it. And you're going to have to look closely because it's actually it's actually it's actually not that easy, not that easy to see at the moment. So here we go. This is the hyssop. So I'm zooming in a little bit to the right and you can see there are tiny little gray leaves and those are the new leaves. They are quite big compared to a few weeks ago where there was next to nothing on this plant. Those leaves are new. And as we go to the left, you can see the branches which are almost bare. And if you move to the top there, hold on, let me just pause it. I'm just zooming in here and focusing. Uh, about three months ago, these were the flowers, tiny little white, little white flowers. These are now the seed pods. Um, so let me just uh, carry on playing it. These are the seed pods. You can see how dry, there's barely anything on it. I'll play it one more time while I while I keep talking through it. The so one thing that I didn't point out a minute ago, but if you look down here, that's a rock. Now, cedar, hyssop, sorry, nearly always grows out of a rock. So now we go back to the, the, the quote. Remember the quote I mentioned at the beginning? Um, he talked about the trees from the cedar of Lebanon to the hyssop that grows out of the wall. All right, so let's start understanding. I'm going to stop sharing now so I can go back to me. All right, so I've actually got a couple of branches of hyssop here. I'm, I'm a guide. I'm not very good at doing things um, without things in my hand. So uh, I have uh, some hyssop branches here. Um, so let's think about what's going on with this hyssop now. It is growing out of a rock. Um, it hasn't had any water since April, but since April, in about June time, it flowered and it's produced its seeds and it's already started growing its new leaves. So if you look at the leaves, you can see they're very tiny, the new leaves. If you, I can't even see any leaves. Um, I can't even see any leaves on leftover from last year here. But just so you know, the leaves that were from last year, as opposed to, were tiny, tiny and gray. Why are they so tiny? Because in the summer, its survival mechanism is to reduce the size of its leaves to as tiny as possible to reduce um, evaporation. And, but if you, want to, if you want to pick it to eat it, then the best time of year is around April, May time, when the leaves are their biggest and just before um, it starts to flower. Now you might say, some of you might say, oh, you can't pick it because it's um, it's protected. 
it's on the protected list. It was actually taken off the protected list about 10 years ago. You're allowed to pick hyssop for your own purposes, not for not for selling, not for retail purposes. I personally try not to pick it in nature. I try to leave as much as possible in nature. Uh, in the reserve, I pick for educational educational purposes. So that's why I picked this one. All right, so this, this hyssop, let's talk about some names. So I'm talking about hyssop all the time. The Hebrew for hyssop in the Torah, in the Tanakh is Ezov, or commonly known as Ezovei Hakil. Okay, the hyssop that grows out of the wall. Um, um, in its common name is called Syrian, the Americans oregano, and for the Brits, Syrian oregano. Uh, and it's basically very, very similar to the oregano that we know that we put on pizza. It's a more bitter version, uh, obviously, of course, also because it's growing in the wild. Um, and it's um, also, wait, I'm just trying to think, Syrian oregano. Oh, yeah, and obviously the most common name that you might know of it is its Arabic name, which is Zata. Now, the plant is called Zata in Arabic. So this plant is called Zata. Israelis and internationally, Zata is known as the, I'm covering my face with this, is known as the hit, the, the mix, the herb, the spice, which is this herb, which has been ground into a powder. It's been mixed with salt, sesame, and I picked this just before as well. This is a sour berry called sumac. And the coating of this, not now because it actually has had the flavor washed away, but the coating of this berry, if I was to put this in my mouth a few a few weeks ago, is very, very tart, sour, and salty. And you take the coating off, you grind it, you make the spice uh, sumac. Did I mention it's called sumac? Uh, sumac, and then you mix it with the zatza as well. So that with the, with a the mix. So that is the mix that, that you would eat if you were to buy it in the supermarket. Um, but what I'm relating to now is the herb, which is which is azov or hyssop, which is the main ingredient in the mix. Um, so I'm British, and uh, if you were to ask me what the British herb is, or when I ask groups actually, when I'm sitting in front of a group from any nationality and I ask them what their herb their their, their national herb is, um, the Brits will generally say salt, the American Americans will say ketchup. Uh, and everybody will laugh about how we have no herbs. Um, so the Israeli national herb is this, is, is zata, is hyssop. And uh, it's not just the national herb now, it's always been the national herb, especially in biblical times where in order to obtain other spices, you would have to trade on the spice root. So whatever grew locally became the dominant flavor. And... Flavor-wise, it's amazing. We'll talk about food afterwards. If I start on food now, I could talk for hours. But it's, you know, it's got a few common common uses here. It's it's called the pizza herb because they put it on pizza. Um, some people put it on chicken, but mostly it's known sprinkled on hummus, on tahina, on labana, on, uh, on a few of the local simple dishes. Sprinkle some of this on top and, um, and you have... Uh, uh, you have it just adds so much to it. Um, so the flavor wise, it's great. Any herb which smells strongly, any plant which sells smells strong is going to have something medicinal in it. And the zata is basically the king of medicines, especially in ancient times and era where medicines were not really um, were we didn't have modern medicine. So it's antiviral, it's antibacterial, it's a sterilizer, it's a purifier. Uh, it's antifungal, it's anti-inflammatory, it's all the antis. In fact, the only anti it's not is antioxidant. And that is why at some stage they started putting sumac into it, I would assume also for flavor, or also because sumac is full of antioxidants. Um, and it was actually, uh, you might recognize it as one of the elements that was used uh, to cleanse a household of someone that had had leprosy. It was a symbolic, um, it's a symbolic uh, and physical puralizer or sterilizer um, for leprosy. Um, and it's used in one of the, uh, in, in the sacrifice uh, of le for leprosy, for cleansing oneself of leprosy. So in uh, Le Leviticus uh, 14, it says, this shall be the law of the leper on the day of his cleansing. The pre pre priest shall command for him cedar wood, notice the reference to cedar again, and hyssop. Um, 
And we're going to understand why those two are put into it later. Now, if we have a plant, remember I mentioned it grows out of a rock. So a plant that grows out of a rock is a very simple plant. It doesn't need very much at all. It doesn't need soil. It doesn't need water. It doesn't need very much at all. And yet this plant we've just understood is the bee's knees in flavor and the main medicine in ancient times, probably probably the equivalent to a rival, trying to think of a modern day uh, equivalent, kind of like um, trying to think of one of those cold herbs that, that, that you would buy over the counter. Let's just say Acamol mixed with a, with a couple of lozenges. Okay, take a couple of Acamol and lozenges and that's pretty much what you get, get here. And think how many chemicals go into that. In fact, um, when I came to work at Nocturnum and didn't know any of this, uh, my my uh, boss here in the office, Miriam, um, every time I came in looking peaky with a headache or a stomachache or a bad mood, she would she would wander off into the kitchen and make me a pot of hyssop tea. And to be honest, that has become my 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 default drink now for when I have a cold. Certainly when I had COVID uh, was to drink hyssop tea and and it numbs your throat. It makes you it stings your throat. You can literally feel the properties um the sterilizing uh, properties on it. Um, and it's it's great stuff. It's really, really powerful stuff. Um, so, so we have a plant here that doesn't need very much and yet gives um, a huge amount. So if you start trying to think what quality, um, um, uh, what quality, uh, what personality, if you think that the, the, we're talking about, we're trying to understand the language of the Bible back then. So just like now we have our modern day metaphors or references, um, which we all speak the same language. And probably if I threw out a quote, something really funny, which I'm not up to today, but something really funny from Chandler from Friends or Joey, we'd all have a good laugh together and we'd understand the common, the common language. Um, so, all the trees and plants were symbols of something. So I mentioned the symbol of pride being the, the cedar tree and the hyssop, the azov, as even I mentioned in the quote I said earlier from Isaiah, is pure and simply the, the symbol or the emblem of a humble and modest person, a symbol of humility uh, and modesty. Um, and... Um, So I actually found this quote, saw this quote from the Talmud, which I think sums up just about everything I've said so far. It's from uh, uh, Midrash Agadol from Mitzora. Um, what is the significance of cedar wood and hyssop for the leper? Okay, so now they're talking to the leper and the leper's being told to cleanse and sacrifice and spiritualize themselves and um, clean, yeah, cleanse themselves in order to be able to move forward and able to be able to go back in amongst the people. They say to him, you were proud like a cedar and the Holy One, blessed be he, humbled you like this hyssop that is crushed by everyone. So the leper was, leprosy was seen as one of the sins of the, the, the illnesses, um, afflictions of uh, the sin of pride. And in order, a proud person means Think of it as a cedar, which is tall and proud and stands out and wants to stand out. But they're saying, leper, be like the hyssop, be humble, be modest, be able to be the one that is crushed by everyone. Everybody has to have a go at you. Everybody, you have to feel part of everyone and not stand out. You have to be willing to humble yourself. Um, and, and when it says crushed by everyone, I wanna show you literally what that means. Because how do we eat this? We don't just gnaw it off the stalk. Um, what we do, although by the way, if you make meat with them skewers and you put these as skewers, it can add good flavor. What we do is we take the leaves off, we dry them and we put them in with a pestle of mortar. And we pick out the sticks because we don't want the sticks don't crush and we crush them. And we crush up the, the hyssop and this is what every probably millions and millions of households down the centuries have crushed. And when I say crush, it's not gently pushing it around like I'm doing. I'm gonna try and show you. It's a really, I don't know, I hope you can hear that crushing sound. It's a really, it, it's being ground under the, the tip of the, 
pestle. I can remember pestle, pestle. Um, and I'm crushing it into a fine, into a fine powder. Now, those are obvious. Those are really obvious quotes. Um, and that's easy. Sometimes it's not always so obvious. Um, so I want to give you one of the less obvious ones um, and where you will be able to relate to, maybe you'll even remember this and repeat this on Seder night, um, wherever we will be on Seder night. It feels like a long way off at the moment. Um, now the hyssop, you may or may not know, is what, what's its re re relation to Seder night is that the children of Israel on the last night before they left Egypt, they were told, we all know, they were told to take a lamb, they were told to sacrifice it, take the blood and put it on the doorpost of the house. And that's what we're told in Exodus, the book of Exodus Shemot, chapter 12. And this is what Hashem says to Moses. He says, they shall take some of the blood, put it on the two doorposts and the lintel in which they are about to, the houses, in which they are to eat it. Okay, very simple. However, half a chapter later, Moses says the same thing he try he passes on the word of the lord to the people he's the the, the me, mediator mediator intermediary but he changes it listen to what he says moses says to the to the children of israel take a bunch of hyssop dip it in the blood that is in the basin and apply some of the blood he tells them to do the same thing that hashem said but notice that he's told them to take a bunch of hyssop okay a bunch of azov um now I have to get this in here because I've been having an argument with a friend on and off over quite a few years and on Shabbat it came up and she told me that she learned that hyssop or ezov um, was not zata, that it was moss. Now that is an interpretation and I'm not going to say she's wrong, but that was her interpretation. Um, I actually, our interpretation and also a quote from Rashi, which said ezov is a plant that has branches. Okay, so here you can see the branches. And also if you can imagine the sort of dipping it into the blood and putting it on the doorposts with the hyssop. Now, why did Moses add this into the children of Israel? And this again is open to interpretation. And often I put this out to a group and I get a myriad of answers. Um, but the answer that I believe most fits here, if you take the, what this is symbolizing, is if a plant name is mentioned, why did he mention the name? Why didn't he say, take a branch? Why didn't he say, take a leaf? Why didn't he say, take a branch of sage? Anything else that was growing around them in the desert at the time, and sorry, in, in the area they were in, in Egypt, um, he specifically said hyssop. So for me, I understand that the, the only reason can be is that he is trying to give them a message. He's telling them he said hyssop not because it makes the best paintbrush. By the way, sage have much better leaves as a paintbrush, but because the hyssop is a message he's trying to give to them. The children of Israel are leaving... The children of Israel are leaving Egypt that night. They are going out into the desert. And boy, are they happy. They're going to freedom. They have been slaves. But they want to party. They want to enjoy. They want to celebrate. However, also, they've been chosen as the chosen people. And they're like feeling pretty, you know, proud about it. Pretty cool. So if you think about it, one of the things I was always taught as a Jewish person is we don't show off about it. We try to be gentle. We try to be to 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 act in the way which is suitable. But you know, we're not shouting out from the from the tops from the rooftops about it. So here is a message that Moses is giving to the Jewish people. He is telling them, "You are going out tonight. The last plague is going to happen. The firstborn of Egypt is going to to die. Of each Egyptian is going to die. Go out with a little bit of modesty and humility." Um, I just want to add in a little personal thing that I connect to that I think modesty is a little bit underrated, uh, is, is become quite underrated these days. People don't necessarily see it as a quality in a world where he who shouts the loudest and gets himself heard is the one that tends to sort of be looked up to or make a noise. The influencers, the celebrities, the people on the front, on the news, the people on the front page. Um, and I think we've lost somewhere along the way. Um, uh, I actually read a book recently, which was uh, uh, about Dale Carnegie and the fact that that changed the whole idea of what a leader was uh, in modern times, that a leader went from being a quiet, thoughtful thinker to being a salesperson of themselves. And I think that 
there is nothing we can learn more from this little plant and the amount it gives and the amount it does. And I'll never forget when um, Nahama Rivlin uh, passed away, Ruby Rivlin's wife. And she was described as a modest person. And I saw someone post that how offensive that was to describe her as a modest person. And I was thinking, no, I think there's nothing better than being described as a modest person. It meant she was a doer. She just didn't shout out about it. She did it behind the scenes without looking for any attention in what she did. Um, I want to share uh, share with you a couple of things. Uh, so I'm gonna just share the screen again. Hold on, share, all right. Um, hold on, let me just stop this. Okay. I don't know why. What's it got? Hold on. I don't know why I can't go down. One second. No, not that one. Sorry, be patient with me. There we go. Okay, so what I did here is is I trans. I just put into modern what modern what we know modern um our modern language of how we would uh, how we would describe humility and pride in modern day. So, you know, this is the way we communicate now. We don't communicate with all our senses. We don't sit under the trees and smell and share and talk and dig and sow and and plow and and harvest and uh, crush and, and, you know, all the things that we do with all our senses, we look at our screens. And if you wanna tell someone the equivalent that they're a branch of hyssop, you would send them this emoji here on the right which uh, is the emoji for modesty, well, for humility. Uh, and if you wanted to basically tell someone that he was an arrogant fool, then you could send the emoji on the left, which uh, apparently, according to WhatsApp, is the sign for arrogance. Um, so I wanted to share that with you. And the last thing I want to finish with um, is, is, of course, it's got to be food related. Um, now, food and hyssop is as I started to say at the beginning, is so much of a part of our lives and Zata in this country, but also especially here in Na'ok Um, My bag smells of it because we crush hyssop with groups. So my bag just smells of hyssop. Um, I actually was laughing before because I walked past this. Um, I don't know if you can see here. Um, this is um, QR codes for the guides that we are meant to take with us when we go guiding. And at the bottom of the bag of the QR codes, I don't know if you can see, there's a whole pile of hyssop that's just fallen in there from somewhere because the stuff's just flying, <laughs> flying all over the place. Um, and um, I would love to get you to taste it. I actually wanted to show you the best way to serve it. Um, uh, the best way to serve it is this is this is called labana. Uh, I make it at home. That's for another lecture. Um, and how do you serve labana best? is you um, you sprinkle hyssop on it, zata, and this is just the raw stuff. A little bit of olive oil, which I can't actually do with two hands. So I'm just, well, there we go, I can do it. A little bit of olive oil. There we go, oh, beautiful. And of course, then a little bit of khala to mop it up. Now, I saw Fanny just joined. So you joined just in time, Fanny. This khala was made an hour ago. Um, by Fanny, who just joined the lecture. Fanny is our local, she works in the office and she she just bakes for us and, and looks after our, our soul, soul via the stomach. And today was a very special day. Um, I'm not in the office every day because I'm freelance, but I came in today because I thought I'll come in and I'll prepare my lecture from here. And every time I come to Na'ok Yunumim for extra time without having to, I'm so happy that I came because we had some amazing experiences today. We had a special ceremony this morning at 11 o'clock uh, during a moment's silence in this country, um, in Israel, for for everybody, uh, everybody that we've lost and everybody that we're praying for. Um, and then this afternoon, Fanny made the biggest, and I've just realized I didn't upload the photo of that one, I meant to, the biggest bowl of dough for challah. And we did have Fashat challah in the office. Um, there was about 20 of us. Uh, she invited, we was, it was invited Tova. Tova is our 
biblical food expert. She's done her doctorate and written books on it. And Tova was invited to do the Hafrashat Khala. She gave us a little lecture about it. And then it was actually her first time ever doing it. And that is what is so unique about Na'ot Kidumim, is that we study the Tanakh. We live and swear by it. We, we breathe it and eat it. But not everybody is religious here. In fact, most people are not observant of the laws, but their passion for the Tanakh and the Bible is every, is, is every bit as strong as anybody else's. So Tova did Hafrashat Khala for the first time. And um, this is the khala. It came out of the oven about an hour ago, it's to the left of it. You can see that sprinkled on the khala is hyssop, which is why I had to take a photo of it. Um, we don't do hafrashat khala every day, I have to point out. We do hafrashat khala, we did hafrashat khala today um, as a way to give hope for, for what's going on, for the soldiers fighting. To the right of here, we have a uh, 931, which was Khala, which was a picture sent to the battalion, the Nakha battalion, um, where one of our staff's son is serving. So she took, she made 931 and took a photo of it and sent it to her son. And and I feel like that the, the, with the Hafrashat Khala and, 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 and the Zatar on top of it and coming today and being part of all of it just kind of brought everything that the Na'ot Kidum is about together. You know, it's it's the it's the simpleness, it's the modesty, it's the it's the prayer, it's the hope, it's the landscape, it's the language. Um and and that is what we are all about. And uh I'm gonna stop sharing um and open up the floor to check out the comments, see if there's any questions and most importantly thank you all for participating. We are doing these every day. Every day is different. Every speaker is different. Every topic is different. The, the lectures are being recorded so that you can go into them whenever you want. And uh, I hope you're enjoying them. But I think even more so, we who don't have tourists at the moment and don't have work at the moment, these lectures are giving us something to, to, to do and to enjoy. And especially for me, I've been doing plenty outside of work. There's always volunteering to do, but these lectures have brought, brought me back to connecting with Na'okidomim and remind me how, how good this place is for, for my soul and everybody's soul who, uh, uh, who, uh, who has a connection with this place. And of course, invite you, all of you, to come and visit us. Come and visit us one day. Please God, one day you'll come back and you'll, uh, you'll be able to come and visit us. So I wish everybody well. I wish everybody's families well. And uh, till tomorrow's lecture. Have a good day. Thank you, Joanna. It was a very interesting. And if you have... Uh, I'm just looking at the um, chats. I'm not sure how to open the chat. the audience have something to say, you can yeah, say... Yeah, I'm just looking at chats. Hold on. In the chat, yeah. Or by saying it. Ah, here. Bonnie has a, a hyssop plant growing in her garden. I know that it's medicinal, but not to that extent. Excellent. Well, there you go, Bonnie. You can, um, you can, uh, you can enjoy that. Um, okay. And everyone else is just saying how much they enjoyed it, which is lovely. Yeah. Thank you very much. That's very kind. Very Thank kind you. Thank you. And tomorrow we'll have another lecture, so you are all invited. Okay. Look forward to seeing you all, and I'll be here uh, next week on Monday. I'll be back here. So whoever wants to uh, join me again. And uh, I have a lecture in the website, which was recorded from last week, all about uh, the pomegranate. So, oh yeah, Alana, amazing for stomach aches. Great, thank you for that, Alana. Thank I forgot about Thanks, Joe, it was amazing. Thank you, Alana, I'm glad you joined, but it's only because I know you haven't got anything else to do. <laughs> Alana's from our office, got, what's from our office, got a, got a broken leg, so. Uh, <laughs> wish you better, Alana, have some hyssop, thank it'll make you better. Thank you, I'll wrap it on my leg. <laughs> Bye.